A mother's long wait for justice came to an end today as Ian Packer was convicted and sentenced to 36 years in prison for the murder of Emma Caldwell. The 27-year-old body was found in remote woodland in South Lanarkshire in 2005. Packer was also found to have committed 11 rapes, 12 indecent assaults and two sexual assaults against a total of 22 victims. He's been dubbed Scotland's worst sex offender. STV's chief reporter Sharon Frew sat down with Emma's mum Margaret and her lawyer Amar Amwar to reflect on the verdict and her daughter's life. When the policeman came to tell me they'd found Emma's body, uh, I had this huge breath. And now I feel as if I can breathe again. That breath I took then never left until now. And I feel as if I can breathe again. It was terrible. I said to my husband, I can't lose another child. And I cried and cried and sobbed. This was before Emma was found. Emma was found on the Sunday and this was the Friday evening. And I just don't know, I just said to him, I can't lose another child, William. I can't lose another child. And he says, don't give up hope, we're still searching. And I just sobbed myself to sleep. And he comforted me. Did you feel when she first went missing that something was terribly wrong? Yeah, right away. My husband never gave up hope of finding her, but I knew right away that Emma was going. Knew she was going. There's something inside me knew that she wouldn't go a day without phoning me. I mean, she phoned every day. And she wanted to know what we were having for dinner or how the family were. Um, she still kept a certain amount of pride, even though she was no circumstances. And we just lived for her coming home. Just love for her coming home. Wanted her home. Emma still had hopes and dreams. She still had hopes and dreams. She talked about going to work on a, maybe a ranch in America or Australia uh, with horses. She still had hopes and dreams. I feel sad for my husband. He was broken hearted about Emma. And then he passed away and the last thing he said to me was, go on. You have to go on, don't let this go. And you've had to go through this trial process and listen to the accused version of, course, of events. Yes. To be quite honest, I didn't believe anything he said. He wanted to move the blame to everyone else. So, no, I didn't believe him. Did you get an insight into the world in which the women and Adela yeah, was living yeah. in? I was naive to all this. I had no idea. We just thought she wanted to stay at the hostel till she could get into rehabilitation some way. Uh, we knew she was a heroin addict, which was a terrible thing, and we worried about it all the time. But we'd absolutely no knowledge that she worked in the streets of Glasgow to fuel her habit. We didn't know how much it cost. It was really hard to take. And of course, Packer admitted to assaulting Emma the months before. Yes. It was a terrible place to live, Inglefield Street. I wish I'd taken her home. At one point I met her one day and she asked me to come and she got into the car and she was crying. And she said, Mum, I need to come home. And I said, we were changing our room at that point and there was no bed there or anything. And I said, could you wait to go home and I'll get Dad to phone you up? And when he phoned up, she said, no, she was fine. And uh, no, there was no point in coming home. And my husband said to me, she just uh, swept her up there and then and told her to come. I've always felt real guilt about that. Does the last day you had with Emma replay over? And yeah. Over? And more than that, when I think about Blindfield Woods, I replay that over and over and imagine 
what agony she went through. I know it's not good for me, but I can't stop it. Certainly the second case, when it was opened up again, they were truly brilliant, these men. It was a really good case. They investigated it really well and I have nothing bad to say about them. They were really good. But do you feel let down and failed by...? I feel let down by the first investigation, definitely. Definitely feel let down there. They just dropped it and hid the case away and that was it. It wasn't even... If, if they had discovered, yes, it, it wasn't these Turkish men that had murdered Emma, then who had? Someone was out there that had done it, but they were just going to let that go till it became a cold case. That was the first we knew that the Turkish men weren't being prosecuted. My husband died the next day. We came to see him, to tell him, told him that, and he died the next day. And it begs the question that in 2005, Emma is murdered. In 2007, the four Turkish men are falsely accused of the crime, one of whom happened to be my client. We knew very early on as defence lawyers, Ian Pack is in the frame. We knew there was evidence there. Police officers within Strathclyde, police at the time, knew it was him. So you had two distinct teams, and yet for some reason, those, those police officers had their lives ruined, their careers ruined, the ones who pointed the finger at Ian Packer, and the ones who were involved were going after false, the false accusation, because they were false. It wasn't the four Turkish men. They went on to bigger and better things. And we are now asking for a full statutory inquiry into the actions of Strathclyde Police and Police Scotland after that and those individuals whose fingerprints were on this case because it, six of those women, apart from Emma, are now dead. They never saw justice. It begs the question why this man was allowed to be free to roam the streets, to rape, to kill, to abduct, to torture and to ruin other women's lives. And there is, there's also the question of misogyny. I think there was a toxic culture at the time of misogyny combined with corruption that meant that women who were vulnerable, women who had drug addictions and women who were sex workers didn't matter, but they did matter. Emma mattered. Can you tell me about Emma, the Emma you remember, how you remember Emma? Um, there's one thing I do remember particularly well. She, she liked rainy days. She always loved rainy days and so did I. My husband used to call us the ducklings because we, we liked wet days. And she came home from the stables and I could see her crossing the square towards the house from the kitchen. And she was soaked through and she was smiling and waving. And she came in and she had a bunch of wildflowers, which she very proudly put in a vase and stuck on the kitchen windowsill. And she went, these are for you, Mum. I love you, Mum. I mean, just, she was so... Such a nice girl. For as long as I've known Margaret, it's that feeling of guilt. It's waking up in the morning, it's going to sleep at night. But on one level, as a mother, she's done her duty for her child and for a husband whose dying wish was to get justice. So it's over in that respect. But for so many others, they, they need answers. Yeah. Emma still needs answers to know, right, OK, we've got this far. Now please answer. Yeah. But you've made the promises. Lord Advocates, Chief Constables, Senior Police Officers, everyone, account for the actions of the past because you can't change the future unless you sort that out. Following the verdict, Police Scotland apologised for how long it took to bring Ian Packer to justice. And Emma's family are calling for an independent inquiry into their mishandling of the investigation. Well, to discuss this, we were joined by retired detective Davy Barr, who suspected Ian Packer from the beginning, and former newspaper editor Brendan McGinty, whose investigative journalism prompted police to reopen the cold case. Davy, so you were part of Operation Grail, which was looking into Emma's murder in 2005, and that was running at the same time as Operation Guard, which was looking into the Turkish suspects. How frustrating was it for you that Packer wasn't even being treated as a suspect? Very frustrating. Very frustrating. He'd, he'd given us enough uh, kind of specialist knowledge uh, of the deposition side of Emma Caldwell, but certainly when I'd interviewed him with my colleague, um, that you would have thought that uh, he, he would have been 
he should have been dealt with as a suspect at that time. And even when the case against the Turkish men fell apart, he still wasn't treated as a, sp a suspect. It was as if they couldn't admit they'd made a mistake. Well, that's what it appears like, yeah. You know, why that decision? Why they came to that decision, I have no idea. But he should definitely have been looked at. But he should have been looked at as a suspect even prior to uh, the case collapsing against the Turkish males. Would you agree with that, Brendan? Yes, I think the, the difficulty in this case is that senior officers in the then Strathclyde Police uh, bet the farm on Theory A, uh, which was the case against uh, Cobb and Oglu on Sir Salmiez uh, and uh, the, the, the fourth man. Um, once the, it, uh, it became apparent that that had unravelled, as Davy says, that should have been the point that they went back and looked at Ian Packer who was, may not have been classified as an official suspect at the time, but let's just remind ourselves, had been interviewed six times, had admitted taking uh, Emma Caldwell uh, to the highly remote location where her body was found, and, and where officers like Davy and other colleagues felt yeah. could even confess to the murder. And you and, and Jim Wilson um, reopened um, it was your investigation, rather, that reopened the investigation. Um, how did you feel today when you were in court to hear the verdict? Um, I think how I felt is neither here nor there, really. But for the for the for the sake of it, um, I, it was it was mixed feelings. I, I, I was glad that the jury had reached a decision. I was glad that it provided closure for uh, some people who, who would have been waiting for that decision with a lot of trepidation. Um, but the thought that comes to my mind is that this can't be the end of the story. There are too many uh, unanswered questions if we take this case back to 2005 and look at all of the milestones uh, that came along the way and, and the lack of action that, that should have resulted. Uh, you refer to the... Uh, to, to the Sunday Mail story, the newspaper mm -hmm. I worked for at the time, the editor Jim Wilson took a, a, a brave decision in the face of some legal advice to publish an, uh, the picture of Ian Packer and, and identify him uh, publicly. Yeah. At that point, if not before, uh, that should have been the, when the police took their own decision to, to reopen yeah. the case, but it took weeks again after uh, that before that happened. And because it took so long to arrest um, Packer, it meant that a lot more women were, were assaulted. Um, and that is that is a terrible tragedy. No, it's disgusting, you know, because I mean, we knew about a lot of these assaults um, prior to the arrest of the Turkish males. You know, so we, we even knew about a lot of them you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, you know, so a lot of uh, kind of sex workers were, were treated horribly and let down by the police. And, of course, uh, Margaret and, and William Caldwell had to wait for so, so long for justice. And, of course, William never saw it because he, the, he, he passed away. Yeah, I mean, by any measure, uh, the, the amount of time that passed is too long. Everybody would surely now accept that. But what needs to happen now is, is for the whole thing to be looked at retrospectively. I don't know how that takes place. Uh, but to, to have proper answers about what those failures were and why they happened. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, you know, the, the public as well as, as the many families affected, none more so than Margaret Caldwell uh, and her family, as you say, really deserve answers around that. And Margaret Caldwell today said something interesting that, that she didn't really feel a full sense of closure. And I can completely understand that. And I can completely understand why others don't feel that full sense of closure, because they've seen Ian Packer convicted. But they're left wondering why it took so long. Uh, and, I, and I think that lots of members of the public will feel the same way and, and just really not quite understand what's going on here. What lessons do you think need to be learned from all this, Davy? Well, I think there have been lessons learned. Obviously, the, the police have, have progressed and they deal a lot better now with uh, sexual assaults, etc., on females, vulnerable people. Um, and it's just part and parcel of policing. I mean, this inquiry was not run properly, um, but the police learned with their mistakes. They've done that uh, over, over time. You know, that's how they get better, mm -hmm. by learning from their mistakes. You both face Packer and... Uh asked him if he killed Emma. What, what did you make of his character? I had kind of asked people who were 
who, who knew Packer uh, and had had contact with him uh, before. And they told me what his response was, would, would be likely to be, that he wouldn't be confrontational. And part of what they said was that he, he, he was, he, that because I'm a man, they thought there was no likelihood yeah. of him becoming confrontational. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to speak to him, he came out of his house, I asked him a series of questions, including the one you referred to there, mm. to ask him directly that if he killed Emma Caldwell. And not only would he not say anything, he ran in the opposite uh, direction mm. and it ended up in this sort of uh, farcical walk around the yeah. estate that he lived in Lanarkshire. Um, and, and we were no further forward with yeah. him at that point. And, and what about you, Davey? <clears throat> um, what did you make of him? Um, well, to be honest with you, it was quite easy to, to tell that he was a liar. You know, um, he just didn't appear. He didn't come across as a genuine person. Um, just not a pleasant person, mm -hmm. you know. Um, okay. But not particularly difficult to deal with from uh, my point of view or, or like in a police point of view. But it was evident because he'd been spoken to three times before I'd spoken to him mm -hmm. that he'd just told a pack of lies. Mm -hmm. okay. I, it, it's interesting. A, a few people I spoke to said, if you get this guy in the dock, he could he, he could end up uh, convicting himself. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they they thought he would be a, an extremely poor witness, but somebody who within himself thought he'd be a great witness. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a delusional element to how he sees himself, mm -hmm. uh, and that was expressed as a frustration uh, throughout the, the the many years that that he hadn't been mm -hmm. charged and, and, and brought to court. There, there, there was a feeling among among people who knew him that he would be really, really bad in court and that he might end up being so bad mm -hmm. uh, that, that it was almost going to be evidence against him. Yeah, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you both very much indeed <coughs> for joining us this evening. Yeah. Thank you.